The upper leg circular cast is usually applied for fractures and soft tissue injuries of the tibia, knee, and femur. In this presentation, the application of the upper leg circular cast will be demonstrated. The objective of the exercise is to show the application of the upper leg circular cast, a plaster cast that will stabilize the fracture or soft tissue injury. The upper leg circular cast is indicated for diaphyseal and proximal fractures of the tibia, knee injuries, and supracondylar fractures of the femur. To apply the upper leg circular cast, the following materials are needed. A stockinette or tubular gauze bandage, scissors, cotton wool for undercast padding, plaster of Paris bandages, which come in rolls of varying widths, plaster slabs, generally five layers thick and available in differing widths, and water or another wetting agent. The water should be tepid or lukewarm with an ideal temperature of between 22 and 25 degrees Celsius. It should be noted that colder water or a bandage that is wetter will allow for an increased working time, while warmer water or a bandage that is drier reduces the working time. The patient should be lying on his or her back with the ankle over the edge of the table. The foot should be plantigrade. The patient's knee should be slightly flexed, 10 to 15 degrees, while both the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles should be relaxed. The buttocks should be elevated from the table with a stiff pillow. After reduction, the leg is supported by an assistant who will check to ensure that there is no rotation of the fracture by verifying that the second toe, the patella, and the superior iliac spine remain in line. The distal border of the cast is located at the metatarsal heads, while the toes should remain open. The proximal border of the upper leg circular cast lies just below the greater trochanter on the lateral side and just below the groin on the medial side. Care must be taken to avoid pressure on the fibular head and neck area to prevent pressure to the peroneal nerve that could cause neuropraxia or nerve damage. After reduction, the leg is supported by an assistant To begin, a stockinette is applied and cut slightly longer than the final cast will be. Starting at the distal border, the cotton wool is gently wound on, once around the foot, and then around the ankle in a figure of eight, making sure that the edge does not cut into the 90 degree bend of the ankle. The cotton wool is wound towards the knee, giving an overlap of 50%. The overlap creates a double layer of padding, which is sufficient in most cases. The cotton wool extends slightly beyond the planned length of the cast so that when the end of the stockinette is folded down, the end of the cast will be padded. Additional cotton wool padding is applied to the patella. The malleoli. and over the heel to protect against pressure points causing pressure sores. It should be kept in mind that when more padding is applied, there will be less support to the injury site. The plaster bandage is dipped into the water, and the excess water is removed by gently squeezing the bandage. Starting with the bottom of the foot, 
the plaster bandage is wrapped around the ankle in a figure of eight. The bandage is passed over the heel and then towards the knee with a 50% overlap in the same manner as the cotton wool. In this case, a 200 millimeter wide plaster bandage is used. A 150 millimeter bandage may also be used. However, it will take longer to apply. A second plaster bandage is applied, beginning where the first one ended. It continues proximally towards the planned upper edge of the cast, and then returns towards the ankle. As additional plaster bandages are required, they should begin with the end of the previous one to ensure even thickness of the cast. To strengthen the cast, plaster slabs are applied to both the anterior and posterior aspects of the cast. A third slab may also be placed to reinforce the proximal border. The loose end of the stockinette is now folded over the proximal edge of the cast. Starting just below the proximal edge, another plaster bandage is added. It will secure the loose end of the stockinette and the plaster slabs. A pillow may now be placed under the patient's leg, although the knee should continue to be supported. The extra plaster covering the toes should be noted. This ensures that there will be adequate support for the metatarsal heads. The excess plaster is removed with the scissors and the stockinette folded over the distal end of the cast. Another plaster bandage is used to secure the ankle and the loose end of the stockinette at the distal edge. As before, it's applied in a figure of eight around the ankle. It should be noted that the plaster is still soft and can be gently molded to the curve of the tibia. Around the knee and just below the condyles of the femur to prevent slippage.
check to ensure that there is no rotation of the fracture by verifying that the superior iliac spine, the patella, and the second toe remain in line. To ensure that the foot is plantigrade, gentle pressure is applied to the metatarsals. The pressure should be continued until the plaster sets. However, the plaster will not reach full strength for 36 hours. The foot should be kept elevated when possible to prevent additional swelling. The exercises for the patient may now be explained and demonstrated. They include flexing the toes and lifting the leg. The application of the upper leg circular cast is now complete. The upper leg circular cast is not initially intended to be a weight-bearing cast, so the patient will need to use crutches, and a foot pad has not been used. To allow for weight-bearing, the plaster can be augmented later with a walking rubber, which will take weight when walking or standing. The foot should be plantigrade. The patient's knee should be slightly flexed, 10 to 15 degrees. The distal border of the cast is located at the metatarsal heads. The proximal border of the upper leg circular cast lies just below the greater trochanter on the lateral side and just below the groin on the medial side. 